In Tibetan Buddhism tradition, we have a reincarnation. For Sri Lanka people, it could be a little bit difficult uh, for cognitive thinking. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, it's quite nice because all the lamas come together, you know, sing, you know, lamas like chanting, good atmosphere, all these things. But theoretically, cognitive thinking might be a little bit tough. You are also one of a reincarnation from some something. Mm -hmm. Maybe Tibetan, maybe chicken, maybe dog, maybe fish, whatever. Mm -hmm. You need uh, one lama to recognize. Mm -hmm. My past life is uh, six reincarnation of Gatupchen. His name is Tenzin Dorji. He most of the time he practices uh, retreat. I don't remember much. I only very simple things. I cannot make distinction of this life and the past life when I was young. Two, three, four, yeah? I cannot make distinction. This life or past life, I don't know. It's one. Later then I remember. I remember. I can make more and more clear. Uh, before it's, it's one life. Like, yeah. ตาบุนิงละอปะมังบยอเรสอปะตาตาบุนิงละปูชังมาอปะเมเกยอมาเรยินายตาบุนิงนางเลอังกะทังบยินบาจิงิอปะกิดดิชิชะกิ Education I remember coming here the first time in Nepal uh, in 1970 in September and um, it was a beautiful season and it was clear and clean and marvelous. And the reason? The reason I was uh, searching for spiritual fulfillment and answer to all the great questions of life. At the time I arrived here, it didn't exist at all. Um, the whole area was uh, right here was just rice fields with tiny little narrow pathways going through it and bamboo bushes um, and beyond the first ring of buildings around the stupa was uh, no building happening at all except I have memory of that wash basin which is down the road here it's very old because um, I lived in the house behind me and I used to go for a bath in that basin, which was uh, the only water uh, spot in the whole village. That's where people, separate men, separate women would take their bath and just soak themselves. And that's the only water source for bathing for the whole environment in those days. We're talking 39 years ago. I came first here after a long, long journey from Holland, hitchhiking overland through uh, Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan, India. And I left Holland because I was searching for, let's say, the absolute truth. And I had a strong inkling that it was connected to Buddhism. I hoped to find the final answer to all my life questions and hopefully um, a teacher and also this place was where the best hashis came from at that time.
This is the office that um, I've done, worked with my husband, my former husband, now my partner in our publishing company, Ron Yeshi Publications. And um, I think we've been in this office since sometime in the, in the 90s, but we've been living in the monastery on and off since the 80s. And we also have a small place up at Nagi Gompo where we stayed with Tugor, and we were primarily there. So all the Ranjan Yeshi publication books, um, including Blazing Splendor, which is the story of Tugorgan's Tuch memoirs, kind of came out of this office in one way or another. So I've had the fortune to also be Tugorgan's biographer. I've been his archivist and I've been his biographer working with Eric Pema Kunzang. And uh, that's the other thing to say is that when you, you're married to the translator, it's a lot easier to get teachings than if you're not. So I had that fortune. So, it's all the time like this. In the evening, we always gathered after the teachings, had a drink. You know, whoever was there, they would, after the teachings, always come to my flat. And um, at daytime, sometimes we would pose in uh, yogic Buddhist attire, uh, just for memory's sake. Here was, was Nubri Turku, holy smoke. He was the heart of the party in Nagigompa. You could go to him at seven in the morning. Huh? You would walk by his house, lived in the first floor where the nuns are living, and he would go always. <whistles> that means come up. So at seven in the morning, we would go up there. Then uh, there was one nun already making uh, buckwheat pancake, which he would paste with hot chili sauce, and then he would get hot rice beer. You know, and a pancake, and a rice beer, and a rice beer, and a pancake. And then, an hour later, we would go to say hello to Tugujin. And, and when you say hello to Tugujin, you always bunk head. Huh? And when you bunk head, you always get... <laughs> you, guys, <laughs> you guys have been visiting <laughs> Nuri Turku. <laughs> that kind of normal procedure in Nagi Gompa. This is so nice. So all, the, all these memories come up. So that was that life in Nagi Gompa. Let's see what else we have. This is Tukujin trying to teach us what the hell I'm doing with those guys. <laughs> These are my tongue lovers. Yeah. These are my tango days. These are my tango days in Kathmandu. After Rinpoche passed away, uh, I brought the Argentinian tango to Kathmandu. I flew him a uh, tango master and then we uh, started teaching tango in Kathmandu, to the eternal horror of my Buddhist friends. They actually came up to me and asked me, are you still a Buddhist? When I asked back, was I ever one? During the period that this monastery was just constructed, you, you stayed here a lot of times. Well, stayed here, I stayed here. Even before that? We had one. big fights. <laughs> <laughs> big, huge fights. Like, I was t staying under very humble circle. Oh, ah, censors. <laughs> okay, no telling. Maybe you tell the difference. People know they you're all... They come and call into my studio <laughs> later on that they yeah, film yeah, more. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not a matter of friends. It's a matter of family. You really don't get to choose after a while your close Dharma mm. friends. Yeah. I mean, if you had to choose them, you probably wouldn't, but then, you know, yeah. I don't think we probably cho would That's have chosen true. our families either, but we yeah. have that. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a connection, a karmic connection, and how you, the older you get, the better you are at being able to respect that connection and appreciate it. Yeah. But it, it's not a matter of, of choice, and, and it would be wonderful if we all had incredible pure perception of each other, and, and I think we, we do as we get older. Yeah. Yeah. We often hear, oh, those people in Nagi Gompa, they're horrible. They fight among each other, and they, they're not harmonious, and they're not how a real Sangha should be. And we all have a big laugh about that. Huh? We, all, we, we always drink together when we meet. Huh? And Tukujin never said, Discipline yourself, behave well. He never said that. He said, look in, the, in your mind, 
uh, invigorate that clarity aspect and deal with whatever comes up. And when you can't deal with it, then come for help. And that's what we, we did. And you, you, you find other uh, Buddhist communities, and if you really look closely why they are so peaceful on the outside, because they do other types of practices. They don't engage that clarity aspect. They don't have that door open where the Buddha and the demons are come. They make a kind of practice where the demon door is closed and a fake Buddhist stillness is maintained. That is called uh, stupidity shamatha, it's, it's a state of stupidity stillness. Because all your negativity, all your heavy thoughts are absent, but the wisdom is also absent in that kind of meditation. I really believe the Western world has a big problem on the subtle body, energy body, stress out, fear, and uh, like uh, messed up. Thinking is quite good, but the feeling, emotion, sensation, uh, subtle body is really messed up. So I'm really working hard on how to calm the subtle body, energy body, and then you can think properly. Because you put so much energy of organized thinking where you know, we don't have, we are like chaotic, but within the, this chaotic of life, but there's some emotionally well-being happening. But which is not 100% right. But uh, the West, you know, everything is like in box. So many boxes from childhood up to death. So you cannot really get out from box. So the mind is busy and the subtle body is stressed out. So this is not so good. The key primary teacher in your life is the teacher who points out the nature of your mind. And it's not that they point it out, you also have to recognize. So it's like they use the example of like flint, you know, touching stone and the spark making fire. So that, that's the most essential practice because through the recognition of my nature that your teacher points out, you will become enlightened. And that's probably the most serious relationship you're ever going to have is the person who's going to lead you to enlightenment. offered me sort of the job of going and stay at his monastery, eat with the monks three meals a day, and have a place to sleep in exchange for working with his, as an assistant with the other painters. And um, that was like a lifeline, and also it showed that he was not like the us usual uh, Tibetan masters of that time. He was very open-minded and he had no machismo and prejudice against female practitioners like I experienced with all the other lamas in general. And um, not only that, but he's, he was a supreme teacher uh, of the most um, supreme path of Tibetan Buddhism. So that, uh, that I still experience as my rescue also, because he took me from feeling discouraged after too many years of being, well, you know, psychologically abused by male dominant machismo monks and who discouraged actually me uh, proceeding on the Buddhist path. What makes Tuku Ujin my personal teacher is like when you sit in Holland in your little chalet, then when you sit there and have your evening cocktail, then it's your personal experience of the sun shining upon you. So among the many suns, wisdom suns that are possible, there's one sun that's always with you, always accompanies you the most, nourishing you the most. And that was for me Tuku Ujin. But, uh, Definitely three millimeters behind is definitely Kensal Rinpoche and Jadra Rinpoche. So it's very nice to have several great masters.
This is a picture from Tuka Organ Rinpoche from 1980 when he was in Malaysia and he was in a really happy mood when that camera, would, the shot was taken. And this is the famous picture that we call Liberation Through Seeing when Eric Pema Kunzang asked to take a photo and, and told Rinpoche, please make this something that people in future generations can look at and see what it's like for someone to be in a meditative state so that it'll be a great benefit for people. Tukorgan Rinpoche has six sons, uh, four of whom are incarnate lamas, and they all have different, it's like the facet of a jewel, and they all have different qualities of him. And um, they're all really great teachers of my nature. Three years, I stayed with him and learning meditation. But that time, I had panic attacks. And after that, I did three years retreat at 13 years old. After I finished my enthronement ceremony, next year, I went to three years retreat. First year, my panic got worse. Then I used my panic as support for meditation. I really tried to apply my meditation technique from my father because my father teach me how to use panic as support for meditation. Because normally there's two problems. We follow the panic, means, yes, sir, panic, everything is miserable, fearful, you know, it's not good. But if we hate the panic, panic becomes our enemy, not good. I just say, hello, but that time I cannot speak Tibetan. I mean, sorry, sorry, I cannot speak English, I speak Tibetan. And so I didn't say hello as English, but I say in Tibetan. <laughs> then after that, my panic became my best friend because of my father's teaching. I had been invited in uh, 1975 by Tuko Uyum Rinpoche, who I knew at that time for quite a while, to come and help uh, with the um, uh, production of these huge, big uh, scroll paintings that are hanging here against the walls and that were the only uh, form of decoration at that time. And um, I worked uh, from morning uh, till the light would be disappearing together with the master painter and some assistants on these scrolls. And they depict the 12 main events in uh, the Buddha Sakyamuni's life. So from his birth till his passing away. And the passing away is the last tanka hanging here. You see the Buddha reclining on a throne and his disciples uh, crying. But um, after the uh, work was finished, then it started the whole finishing up of the monastery started and preparing for the arrival of the big Lama. And then of course I had to find a place somewhere else because it was not a monastery for females, it's not a nunnery, and I had to move out, and that was a very hard process. I felt like being expelled from the family home, you know, it was, it was a tough period. I had a problem before, depression. Uh, if, you, if you need to struggle with your thought and emotion, yes, you can. But if you don't want, there's a way. There's a, another way, another exit door that you can let it go. So I think in my everyday life, that teaching was the most uh, benefit for me. So I think I got from him. Rumbucheke, Kaduina, Chamda Ninga Madawache, Sungu Yaris Rumbuche. Mele Chansemche, Mele Pembache, Momosuna. Think is some of the Kenta, Mele Ninga, the Chansemchen. Benefit Kayunguena, Zan and go out Hako Mindus to do poo capsula. That Tadangi only realized Chasons. Miller Pemba no magic, Chasm said, the body, Shen Chungangap and Nodius, 
Someone took a job with you. Not to sit at dinner, Mamun Zingus, he gave the Lamsat or Lana Lamsat, Jabgris, Shedanch of Missing Dennis. In a Yabby call of the Katu in the Semla Shan, Chitungi, I realized Cheto Maso. That under some of the money, something in the Nanga Chamberedos, that in some me, Tusula, me Nala, there's Russian Bate, Yabdan Zavilaman Bacati, some of I would like to give uh, one example of, of Rinpoche's humbleness and uh, fatherly uh, kindness. In Singapore, when we were both in Singapore, I was taken quite ill one night, and the Chinese monk said, we must get him to hospital. And uh, Sunam, who was another monk, he said, uh, no, not until we wake up Rinpoche. And uh, when Rinpoche came <coughs> to my bed, he said, all you go away, go away, go away. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> after he had done some puja with the burpa, and I felt something going <coughs> completely out from me, and then he sat on my bed and putting cold compressions on my head, you know? <coughs> so that was an example of how humble and how fatherly he was. They're human beings. When, when, when Kenzo Rinpoche passed away and the message was related to Tuku Ujin, I was in his room. When the message came, Tuku Ujin started crying for two days because his friend and teacher and brother in Dharma, his teacher in Dharma, had passed away. He cried for two days. And we were all first shocked and then really touched that about this human quality in, in a realized master. And we had so much time with the teacher, which is also uh, not the case anymore <laughs> these days, since there are huge numbers. Uh, droves. Droves <laughs> coming to see uh, these teachers that have uh, less time and move more about, you know. To, we can hardly moved about, he stayed in one spot most of the time, so he was very easily accessible. Nowadays, teachers are not so easy accessible, and you have to comply to uh, the older students that make up rules and set up barriers to reach. So we had unusual, a lot of freedom and space to express ourselves in whatever our path was at that point. Just look at uh, the way how Rinpoche said hello to people. Yeah. You know, the yes. Tibetans have what they call utuk. Ta Touching the head. Would you yeah. please, his eminence? Boy, <laughs> they, always have, they give each other those head it's bumps. And Tuku Ujin did even with the cowboys, the working stuff, everybody from the 16th Kama part down to the cowboy. The sweepers. Uh, yeah. uh, touching foreheads. Mm -hmm. And that also shows how he kind of uh, experienced the Buddha nature in every being. I've never seen that with any I've other never lama. Seen it. Yeah. For quite a while, Tugorgan Rinpoche was, was ill. He had gotten quite weak, I think, in 1994, and that weakness progressed into other um, problems with his body, and he ended up having a gallbladder operation in Germany. And he never quite recovered from that gallbladder operation. And at that particular time, there was a lot of unpleasantness, not just within his own group. There's the unpleasantness with the, with the Karma Kargyu uh, regents. There was unpleasantness amongst Tugorg and Rinpoche's Western students, and there was some unpleasantness or not very good feeling amongst his Tibetan and Nepali nuns. So it was a very, very negative time. The energy was, was really, really bad. Everyone's trying to find blame because it's, it's coming to a point where one can look at impermanence. And the teacher is not well, and he's not getting better. So even though it would be nice to say that the last year and a half or two years of his life were, were great, they weren't.
I was due to come here in three days' time, so he passed away three days before I was due to get here. And uh, I had a dream which was quite significant. I related it to Atul Rinpoche. He said, that was Rinpoche telling you that he had already gone. So that, uh, it was quite shattering because we didn't expect him to go that quickly. In February, a phone call came and I had the phone next to my bed and it was Andreas's voice from Nepal mm. and saying that uh, Tukoyan had passed away and that he had kept his promise uh, to call me as first oh. uh, at that moment. And I, I never forget that, that Andreas uh, was so mindful to, to do that. Living with a wisdom master is a great learning process, but also this passing when you're left alone yeah. and thrown, so to speak, out of the nest. Eventually, we have to go through that experience, which is very important. But it can be traumatic. For me, it was traumatic, definitely. And it's, again, something I had to work through. When one lama called and asked about the signs and, and the different lamas were trying to tell him different signs, he said, no, 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 what's the sky like? And the sky was completely crystal clear blue and a much deeper blue than I think it, it has been since in, in my perception. And, and that feeling of his wisdom and compassion really just completely encompassing the whole area, which is very, you can't describe it. So the physical body was gone, but not that continual connectedness through love and compassion. After he passed away, then we were kind of thrown back on ourselves. And then you suddenly discover that you are not such a great meditator. It was actually more the energy of Tukujin which was carrying us on. At least me. So for me, what, that was the case. So that was an interesting experience to, to see how much of this 12 intense year has been Tukujin's blessing and energy, and how little was actually myself my own realization, my own meditation. I think it makes sense to uh, spend a lot of time now on introspection and meditation. Yeah, I think that would be a sensible thing to do.
Well, for my own feeling, the closest I come to this point of combining Buddhism and my uh, work as an artist is Milarepa. The reason to choose Milarepa as the subject for this book was uh, my journey to Tibet in 1987. So I perceived the um, the Chinese, the way they have occupied the country. And so when I traveled back from Lhasa to the border of Nepal on my way back, I reflected what I could do to sort of express my support for the Tibetan people's spirit. And um, I thought, well, it would be good to emphasize a, a true Tibetan hero. The main teaching of the story of Milarepa has to do with um, the power of um, the will and how any adverse circumstances can be conquered by willpower. He attains uh, full uh, liberation from suffering and uh, realization of Buddhahood. I usually do three main retreats a year and um, they're somewhere between three and six months or, or one and six months depending upon how much time I get and um, I think you probably heard this before from us older practitioners I would like to spend more time in retreat one of my teachers has asked me to spend eight months and to do four months of work so um, that would be my aspiration. It, it hasn't happened yet, but I have been quite fortunate over the years to spend a lot of time in retreat, consecutive time as well, and be near to Gorgon Rinpoche for about, oh, for 13 of the years that I was seriously practicing, I could do retreat and then go at the end of the retreat and ask questions. And so that made a really big difference. So a few years ago we did a huge exhibition of Buddhist art as preserved in Tibet in the Villa Hügel and we brought about 130 objects from Lhasa, from the Potala, from Dalai Lama's residence, Nobolinka and other monasteries. We brought that to the Villa Hügel in Essen and the Potala alone they have more than 800,000 art objects catalogued in, in one place alone. So the, the wells of art there is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I got the job for two years and it was so intense that I used to get up at morning at five, made my coffee and by later six o'clock I was on the computer and would work till uh, seven or eight in the evening till I finally collapsed. And then the result was uh, a heavy dober of a catalog which everybody complained about because it's impossible to carry it through the exhibition. I, my, myself, I'm interested to stay in nice forest. Huh? I cannot stay like Milarepa. I need food and shelter and comfortable. And I want to practice a lot and read a lot of books, rest nicely, huh? and uh, with some friends. Not so many people going around here, there. This is sort of my interest. Not very fancy big house or not big responsibility. This is my sort of natural interest. But whenever I try saying to my teachers, I want to do it, not one, not two, all of them sort of, sort of, they have meeting or and say, want to say something, same words, they say, why you want to do it? You are reincarnation. Still you need to do something, then, then there's no purpose to, Reincarnation has nothing, no, no, no value. Past, past, past lives, you've done so many practice, so your mind 
is need to be a little bit more stable than so your love, your wisdom, your tolerance need to be something different. Otherwise, what purpose? And you're born for what reason? To help a sentiment, right? I'm looking very much forward to uh, the event tomorrow, and it will be a huge, big, uh, festive uh, occasion with uh, a few thousand people arriving from everywhere in the world to uh, attend the event. And uh, for days now, I hear uh, the sound of all the monks uh, practicing uh, their instruments to play uh, ritual music during this ceremony. and. Um, Outside, they're uh, making a red carpet of red paint on the, the entranceway, and they're going to decorate it with eight auspicious symbols laid out in uh, rice. And um, yeah, it will be exciting, totally. Uh, I had a very strong feeling when I met the mother of the incarnation in, I believe it was 2001, I traveled to Beer in India. And I met her and I said to my partner, Eric Pemakonzang, she's pregnant and she's pregnant with Tuku Organ's incarnation. And no one even knew she was pregnant at the time. So throughout the year, while she was pregnant, I kind of kept tabs on her, and of course we found out that she had had a, she was having a boy, and then I had a very strong experience on the morning that the child was born, and I knew the child was born. So um, it took about five or six years for Trisha Grimbache to recognize uh, the boy, so it was more like okay, now now it's official. And uh, Trulshi Rinpoche is a very old lama by now, uh, born in Tibet, and he is the highest authority um, for the situation to indicate and recognize reincarnate lamas from the same tradition and transmission lineage as uh, Tukuyans. And he is the one who had indications about the parents and the place of rebirth, and he actually confirmed uh, that this person is actually the person who has the mind stream of Tuku Uyim, is the incarnation of Tuku Uyim Rinpoche. The, our son is Tuku Uyim, so then it's recognized by Tuku Rinpoche. So we have no choice but to say, you know, okay. You know. <laughs> yeah. People are always looking at, you know, lamas who have consorts and consorts from good families and what kind of children they're going to have. And Natan Choling is the fourth incarnation of Chogyur Dechen Lingpa. And his past life was the father of Organ Top Gil Rinpoche and Siga Control Rinpoche. And he was, he was a great lama and it was because of him that we actually have the books of the Choling Terser, he brought them out of Tibet. So he was a Lama who accomplished a lot, even though he died quite young, but also he's a, a, a incarnation of a, of a Siddha-type Lama. My guru, Tim Rinpoche, and the six in Karmapa, uh, they recognized me since I remember when I was like two, three years old. And so they recognized me as the reincarnation of the Chojulingba. 
before the incarnation of Chuchu Lingba. So, so since then, you know, I came down in the monastery to India, and I grew up in the monastery, and so, yeah, this is about it, I think. <laughs> so, everyone was, everyone looks at a person like Nathan Scholing, and you can meet him, and, and, and actually there is a yogi. There is one facet of a yogi, this, this very simple, yet stable individual who you feel emanates so much love and compassion. And then his beautiful consort, who amongst the Tibetans, people had talked about her for a long time. If you listen to Tibetan gossip, they had always talked about that daughter of a Gyare Rinpoche as being special, as being a Dakini, a Khandro. So it's probably no surprise that such remarkable parents will have remarkable children. Yeah, since, you know, uh, they recognize me as a reincarnation, my job as a teacher, so eventually, yes, I'm going to think myself as a teacher. And uh, then, yeah, director, you know, I, I met... Filmmaker. Filmmakers, you know. <laughs> uh, I think I like to make film. <laughs> I think, you know, definitely that I like to share the, you know, Buddhist story like this to inspire other people to become a more, uh, how to say, peaceful, calm, more, how to say, compassionate person. So I think that's the mod uh, main motivation that, and uh, that's how I, you know, choose the, Malarepa too. So then of course movie is, you know, first thing I thought that movie is because of the so powerful. Mm -hmm. And it can reach many, many people. Example like in Nepal, you can see in Delhi and you know, <laughs> everywhere now there's Malarepa. Pirated version. Pirated version <laughs> of the series, you know. But it's good, it's doing its purpose, yeah? Do joyous, you know, to, you know, at this moment. Uh, everything went very well, you know, and uh, to see all the students of Dugogin Rinpoche come from all over the world, and to especially have Tushik Rinpoche come down, I'm extremely, I mean it, I, I'm really grateful, you know. I was thinking that if he couldn't come, the ceremony will not be full for me as a mother, you know. Because as a mother, you know, you always want the best for your child. So for me, having Trishi Gurumbhichi come and bless the Yangtze, bless us, bless everybody, bless the ceremony, for me, that was my biggest aspiration. I was always praying, please make sure he comes, you know, so I'm very happy.
I was also recognized as Rinpoche. Uh, in fact, two. In fact, two. One, uh, 16, his holiness, 16 Kamapa, recognized as me, seven young Minju Rinpoche. And another one, his holiness, Dingu Chenzi Rinpoche, recognized me as second Ganji Rinpoche. And I have now big confusion because I have two mine here. And they all fight. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> no problem. But uh, I don't talk about that. And special in Tibetan Buddhism, we don't talk about our inner quality. Oh, I'm such living Buddha and come to this earth and to save you, you know. Mm, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't talk about that. So, he been enthroned in Kanyang Shirobling Monastery two days ago. So now he's coming to his place, one of his place. So coming here as auspicious and um, relaxing a little bit and some small ceremony and eat food and there's some culture show. Hopefully he have a good time here. Then tomorrow he's going to Nagigomba. interesting to see that they in the West there a kind of Buddhism is spreading where very important elements of Buddhism are missing and trust and devotion is one of the major elements so from the get-go I mean Buddha himself when you look at the early scriptures he always inspired faith and devotion in his students and that is the inspiration why they followed him if you lack that I mean why why would you go into that trip? And there are specific meditations how to open up your mind to these kind of feelings which we Westerners are very scared of. I mean, devotion to what? To guru and what might the guru do with us? And all these doubts are coming up. So one needs to first learn gradually what is devotion, to what is devotion directed, what is a Buddha, what is the Buddha nature, how does it relate to me, what is a qualified guru, what is a fake guru, how can I distinguish those things? You need to educate your mind in order to free your mind. 
And what is the sad thing is that there are not so many wisdom masters around and that Western students somehow expect that the Lamas kind of come to their doorstep. When you're really interested in, in finding wisdom masters, then you have to go. Basic understanding is to base on life after life. And that base on is mind and matter. And mind is different from matter. So matter exhausts some point in this time, but the mind stream still goes. Until the karmic pattern exhausts, ego clinging diminish. And then the, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, taking birth will cease. So then, which we call as uh, nirvana or, or enlightenment or liberation. So until that, there's a continuation of life. And it takes time. It might take time, 500 lifetime. It might take 100, 1 billion lifetime. So, you know, genuine Buddhists, they don't mind. Whenever, one day, they will reach enlightenment. But the path itself is good, peaceful, compassion, helping other people, not harming yourself. So, I, I'll, how long it takes doesn't matter. If there's suffering, then it is a problem. So, you have to finish as soon as possible. But the journey of enlightenment is not a, a problem. You know, it's good. No, it's a peaceful path. Today is uh, the very auspicious day where the incarnation, the reincarnation, the rebirth, so to speak, of Tuku Ujin is coming back to the monastery here. And today is the third major re residence of Tuku Ujin, Nagi Gompa, where is here to now. And that was Rumbaji's favorite, favorite place. He was a very good father. He built a monastery for all of his sons. But his favorite place was up here because he didn't like to stay out there in the valley where so much business, so much people are. People in Tibet take it really seriously. You know, you have a tuku, so you give it up. And parents give up their kids joyfully, you know? So that's the difference. But now times have changed also. And then, uh, like, I think these days, you know, like, I, I don't like to say give up. It's more like he'll be moving to different places. Like, So he'll stay here. We'll come here once in a while to see him. And during his vacations, he can come up to India, see us, spend mm -hmm. some time. And sometimes we can go out of the country, <laughs> you know. So it's 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 not like giving up. <laughs>
Wilt u naar aanleiding van deze uitzending reageren of een gratis programmagids bestellen? Bezoek dan onze website boeddhistischeomroep.nl DVD's van onze programma's kunt u bestellen op 010 411 3977.